federal government, the future of American competitiveness was bleak. It has recommended increased efforts in science, technology, engineering, and math. And we have failed to see this vision. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield back. Young, the lady yields back. The purpose does the gentleman from Minnesota rise? Without objection. Be in order. The gentlemen and ladies, please clear the well, clear the aisles. The gentleman from Minnesota is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to congratulate Minnesota's Fire Officer of the Year, Dale Specken of Hopkins. Known for his can-do attitude, loyalty, and fairness, Dale has long had the respect of all of his colleagues because of his passion for teaching others about fire prevention and going beyond the call of duty to help others and the community. Dale comes from a long line of firefighters and in 1981 joined the family business. Working hard and rising through the ranks, he became Hopkins Fire Chief in 2005. Being the dedicated community that servant that he is, Dale also serves as the emergency manager and fire marshal for the city of Hopkins. I want to congratulate Dale on being named Minnesota's Fire Officer of the Year. Thank you for your many years of tireless service and for your unwavering commitment to our community. I yield back. Gentleman yields back his time. For what purpose does the gentleman from California rise? To address the House for one minute and rise and extend my remarks. The gentleman from California is one minute. I was so pleased to hear my colleague a moment ago, Mr. Chair, uh, Speaker, talk about firemen. However, the continuing resolution that is now before this House would lay off 1,333 firemen across this nation. It would also lay off 2,410 firefighters across this nation. We're now into the sixth week of the Republican control of this House, and yet we have no jobs. But instead of a jobs bill, we have a jobs layoff bill. The continuing resolution will lay off tens of thousands, indeed hundreds of thousands of men and women all across this nation, from firefighters to cops to construction workers. Seventy-six projects that are going to be built in infrastructure will be canceled. We're looking at 200,000 young children that will not be in the Head Start program, which means their teachers and the others that are running those programs will be laid off. This is the most anti-jobs bill I could possibly imagine. And here we are in the six weeks, no jobs, just job layoffs. I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back his time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Arizona rise? Mr. Speaker, um, ask your permission to address the House. You intend to address the House for 60 seconds. The gentleman from Arizona, um, without objection, is given, recognized for one minute. Uh, Mr. Speaker, today is one of those special days, and for many of us, you think of it as Valentine's Day, but for Arizona, this is our 99th birthday. Today, we begin our 100th year. We, and the wonderful folks in Arizona, which is a stunningly beautiful state, for those of you who have not had a chance to visit us from the Grand Canyon down through the mountains, down even further to the desert plateaus, to the grasslands down south, come join us for our 100th anniversary celebration. All through this year, all up and down the state, there's going to be special activities, special dinners, special commemorations for the baby state, the Valentine State, that is Arizona, begins its 100th anniversary today. Thank you. The gentleman yields back his time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Tennessee rise? The gentleman from Tennessee, without objection, is given one minute to address the House. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last night in Los Angeles, California, the Grammy Awards took place, and I'm proud that one of my Memphis constituents, uh, Kirk Whalem received a Grammy. I'm also proud that, proud that a special award was given to Al Bell, who had been the head of Stax Records. But even further, there was a tribute to Solomon Burke, one of the great song uh, singers of all time. The tribute was done by Mick Jagger. Nobody can quite do anything like Mick Jagger. But it was fitting that Mick Jagger did Solomon Burke because Solomon Burke in the 60s was one of the first African Americans to do Bob Dylan. And Bob Dylan was there too. 
and then Eminem got the best rap song. So it was a good spirited night at the Grammys of biracial, cultural cooperation and understanding and love. Thank you. Gentleman yields back his time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? I request permission to address the House for one minute. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, the EPA is now going after the farms and ranches that feed the American people. They say ranching and farming causes dust. Well, no kidding. So out with the dust and in with the more regulations and fines. Dust has been around since man first tilled the soil with primitive plows and herded sheep and cattle in the wide open spaces. The EPA also doesn't like the dirt roads used by pickups and tractors that crisscross the cattle ranches and farms that are in Texas and in the heartland of America. So the Environmental Police Agency is going to regulate the dust created by farming and ranching by imposing expensive fines on the breadbasket of America. The dust police rule would make it more expensive to feed America. First it was punishing the domestic energy industry. Now they're going after the agriculture industry. Does the EPA wish that we import all of our food like we do crude oil? This sounds a little bit un-American to me. Maybe the EPA needs to just hit the road. And that's just the way it is. I yield back. Gentleman um, yields back his time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Minnesota rise? Without objection, the gentleman from um, Minnesota is recognized. Mr. Speaker, minute. I rise today to congratulate the valiant, heroic, brave people of Egypt who for 18 days took the street in Tahrir Square and used uh, the people power to stand up and to liberate themselves. For 18 days they called on things like governance and to have a hand in their own destiny and their own democracy. Human rights, bread, dignity, things like that. I was so proud watching the people of Tahrir Square in Egypt stand up and claim their dignity back and I, and I was proud to be able to say that so many Americans stood shoulder to shoulder with them. I also want to add, Mr. Speaker, that it demonstrated that the people of Egypt reject the philosophy of Al-Qaeda, reject the philosophy of extremism, and use nonviolent tactics tested the world over to bring forth democracy. This is a wonderful testament to people who want freedom, justice, and equality to stand together peacefully. And it was so good, Mr. Speaker, to see people of multiple faiths, Muslims, Christians, other people, Jews, standing together to say we want a new day in Egypt. So, Mr. E uh, Mr. Speaker, I yield back. And again, my hearty congratulations to the people of Egypt. The gentleman yields back his time. Are there uh, any other requests for one minute? For what purpose does the gentle lady from Texas rise? Without objection, the gentle lady is given one minute. As I was traveling, uh, Mr. Speaker, to Washington, I had the opportunity to uh, read the local newspaper. It's a good time for us to reconnect uh, with our community, uh, those that we have not been able to see, to hear their stories. And I was uh, impacted uh, by a story of uh, two students uh, at the University of Texas uh, from different walks of life who had had a passion for football in one instance and a passion for basketball in another instance. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, as they were aspiring to their dream, both of them found that they had a congenital or a serious uh, heart defect. Young men, one who had come out of the heart of Acres Home, a historically African-American community, uh, raised by his grandmother, of whom he loved and he chose to stay close to home by going to UT Austin to play basketball. What a devastating blow to find out he could not play when he first got there. What about the young man, huge in size, uh, that almost lost his life on the football field? But the story is, uh, in this month where we commemorate African-American History Month, one was a Caucasian and one was an African-American. It just shows in this nation how we can work together and come together. These young men have, in a sense, overcome uh, their challenges, and they represent American heroes. I pay tribute to these two athletes at the University of Texas. Thank them for their leadership. I yield back.
Again, are there further um, one-minute requests? Lays before the House the following personal requests. Leaves of absence requested for Mr. Burton of Indiana for today, Mr. Culberson of Texas for today, Mr. Danny Davis of Illinois for today, and Mr. Young of Florida for today. Without objection, the requests are granted. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January the 5th, 2011, the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Aiken, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the majority leader. It's not Under the Speaker's announced policy of January the 5th, 2011, the gentlewoman from um, Virgin, Virgin Islands, Ms. Christensen, is recognized for 60 minutes as a designee of the minority leader. And I'm pleased to lead this special order for this hour on behalf of the Congressional Black Caucus and to have some of my distinguished colleagues join me. But as we begin this special order to call attention to the travesty that the Republican leadership is proposing and the cuts that they will be trying to enact for the balance of this year, I want to say something to begin to put these cuts into a particular perspective. I'm sure that everyone is aware that today is Valentine's Day, a day in which we supposedly celebrate love. As the Republican leadership begins the onslaught on some very important programs, I want to share with them and all of us something that Dr. Cornell West has been reminding us of, of, as of late. And that is that justice is what love's, love looks like in the public arena. Justice is what love looks like in the public arena. So on this day when we show those close to us we love them, we should also be showing the American people our commitment to justice. Mr. Speaker, the cuts being proposed with the continuing resolution are anything but just. With that, I'd like to yield first to our distinguished assistant minority leader, Mr. Clyburn, the gentleman from South Carolina, who has been a leader for his state, for this Congress, and for our country, particularly a, more, a, a leader uh, of high morals who leads this country in making sure that we stay true to the values that this country was founded on and um, continue to operate in that, in that vein. Uh, I yield such time as he might consume to Mr. Clyburn. Thank you very much. I thank the gentlelady for yielding me this time and thank her for her tremendous leadership on this and many other areas that come before this Congress. I want to uh, take just a few moments uh, to talk about an issue that's very, very important uh, to a significant number of citizens in our great country. The Wharton School of Business recently held a conference named in honor of Whitney Young, a leader and friend in the struggle for social justice, equality, and civil rights. Whitney Young is probably known best for growing and transforming the Urban League from a sleepy little organization into one of the country's biggest and most aggressive crusaders for social justice. What he is less known for is for his call for a domestic Marshall Plan, a program to eradicate poverty and deprivation in the United States, similar to the Marshall Plan that was launched to reconstruct Europe after World War II. I would like to use that call for a domestic Marshall Plan as a jumping off point for my remarks this evening. Some of Whitney Young's ideas were incorporated into President Lyndon Johnson's war on poverty over 40 years ago. Yet the scourge is still with us. Before the war on poverty and the Great Society, 
we had the New Deal. All of these investments in America helped to move us forward as a nation. But some communities have been left behind each time. And we have begun to call them persistent poverty communities, places that have had more than 20% of their population living beneath the poverty level for more than 30 years. Approximately 15% of all counties in America qualify as persistent poverty counties under this definition. These counties are diverse and spread across the country, including the Appalachian communities in Kentucky and West Virginia, Native American communities in South Dakota and Alaska, Latino communities in Arizona and New Mexico, African American communities in Mississippi and South Carolina, and urban communities in Philadelphia, New York, Baltimore, and St. Louis. Democrats represent 149 of these counties, with a total population of 8.7 million. Republicans represent 311 of these counties, with a total population of 8.3 million. 14 with a total population of 5.3 million are split between Democrats and Republicans. A total of 43 Democrats and 84 Republicans represent at least a part or one of these counties. 35 of the 50 states have at least one persistent poverty county. 15 of South Carolina's 46 counties meet this ignoble distinction, and seven of them are in the 6th Congressional District that I proudly represent. This is not a red state or blue state issue. That's why in the map beside me, the persistent poverty communities are colored in purple, because poverty knows no political affiliation. Poverty has never been limited to race, region, or creed. For many years, counties along the I-95 corridor in South Carolina were passed over for uh, economic development. Federal funds found their way to South Carolina, but mysteriously did not find their way into the 6th Congressional District. The I-95 corridor is plagued with health disparities. The 6th District has the dubious distinction of leading the state in incidents of stroke, heart disease, and diabetes. We lead the state in amputations for both adult and juvenile diabetes. This region is known as the buckle of the stroke belt and is home to the highest rate of prostate cancer deaths among black males in the South. Scientists tell me that many of these health problems are directly related to water quality. In some of these places in my district, the water is not fit for human consumption. One particular instance in which my office was involved, the health department would not allow a water hookup to a home because of the contamination. Yet, the people still drink the water because they have no choice. Two years ago, I authored a provision in the Rural Development Section of the Recovery Act that we call the 10-20-30 formula. It stipulated that at least 10% of the funds be targeted to counties where at least a 20% poverty rate has persisted for the past 30 years. The formula is working. Marion County, South Carolina received a $3 million loan and a $4.7 million grant to build 71 miles of water lines and three water projects in Orangeburg County 
benefited from this, this formula, including $5.6 million grant to bring potable water to this, these communities. Citizens in these counties will soon be enjoying their first clean glass of water from the faucet, free of contaminants and pollutants, thanks to this formula. In the coming days and weeks, I will personally reach out to all 127 members who represent persistent poverty levels of poverty counties in hopes of bringing together a bipartisan task force to ensure that these areas are not overlooked as we emerge from the recession. Hopefully, this task force will work to build on the excess, success of the 102030 formula in the Rural Development Program by extending it to all federal departments with grant-making authority going forward. I thank my friend from the Virgin Islands for allowing me to speak about this important issue today, and I'll yield back my time to her. Thank you, Mr. Clyburn, and we thank you so much for developing that formula that has begun to help communities that have been long distressed with high poverty levels for all that time, and we look forward to the work of your task force. Obviously, this is not a Democrat issue or a Republican issue. It's a, an American issue, and we look forward to supporting that task force and the work that you will be doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, at this time, I'd like to yield six minutes to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Scott, who leads the Congressional Black Caucus budget and has led it for all the years that I have been here. And um, I must say that uh, in all of the budgets that he has helped us prepare and present to this body, they have uh, been thoughtful, they have provided funding to imp the important uh, areas that our communities and some of the communities that Mr. Clyburn talked about needed, but still has reduced the deficit in every instance. So I yield you six minutes. Thank Mr. you. And I thank the gentlelady for yielding. And if we're going to be able to address the important matters that our uh, assistant leader has suggested, it's going to depend on our ability to get the budget under control. When we talk about the budget, we need to put the budget in perspective. Uh, I was first elected in 1992, and in 1993, we considered a budget that put an end to fiscal recklessness. We passed a budget that, by the end of the eight years of the Clinton administration, had not only eliminated the deficit, but had created enough surplus to have paid off the entire national debt held by the public by two years ago. That would mean that we'd owe no money to Japan, no money to China, no money to Saudi Arabia. That budget also created a record number of jobs and record economic activity as noted by the record uh, increase in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So we had a good budget. We had fiscal responsibility, but unfortunately in 2001 we came, that came to an end when we reverted to fiscal irresponsibility. Under the Bush administration, we passed two tax cuts without paying for them, a prescriptive drug benefit without paying for it, fought two wars in the middle of cutting taxes, a $700 billion bailout, all of which put us in the economic ditch. Now, in order to get these uh, large deficits we now have under control, we're going to have to make some tough choices. Uh, unfortunately, last year we started off in the wrong direction. We considered a huge tax cut bill uh, last year that went the wrong direction. It's total cost, a two-year cost of $800 billion. And to put that in perspective, $800 billion is more than we spent in the TARP program, about the same as the stimulus, about the same as what the health care bill spends in 10 years, that tax cut bill spent in two. In case people don't really appreciate how big a bill that was, we checked with the National Conference of State Legislatures and ascertained that the total general fund budget add them up of 50 states, general fund budget of 50 states was $650 billion. We, in one vote, cut taxes by $800 billion. And before that bill was passed, we asked, well, how are you going to pay for it? 
uh, one of the ways that um, we jeopardize Social Security in the bill, cutting the payroll tax. The money coming into Social Security will, be, uh, has, will have to be subsidized by the general fund. Uh, that puts the Social Security program in competition with everything else in the budget. And so we put Social Security in jeopardy, and we also had tax cuts for dead multimillionaires. I say dead multimillionaires because everybody expected us to have a, an exemption of $3.5 million, $7 million per couple, uh, where you pay no taxes and begin paying taxes after that. Well, we increased that exemption for the amount you can get without paying any estate tax to $5 million. That additional, and reduced the rate, that additional assistance to dead multimillionaires cost $24 billion. Again, how are we going to pay for it? You can look at the continuing resolution in next year's budget, a budget that the Republicans have already attacked for not cutting enough, and look what it does to the safety net. LIHEAP, the Low Income Heating, Assistance, Heating and Energy Assistance Program for those that can't pay their energy bills and are risk freezing to death, we cut that by half a billion dollars to help fund the multimillionaires uh, tax cut. Women, infants, and children, the WIC program, so that babies can be born healthy and start off on the right track. We cut that program. Job training and employment services. For those who've lost their jobs and may never return, trying to get a job that will be there, we cut that program. Community health centers, public housing, in a time of record foreclosures, we're cutting those programs to fund that, partially fund that tax cut. Opportunities. Head Start. We only, we only address the needs and Head Start for half the eligible children. We're going to cut Head Start to deprive those children, in addition, millions of children, of that important opportunity. Uh, starting off on the right track, we found that Head Start will increase graduation, graduation rates, reduce uh, delinquency, reduce need for welfare, save more money than it costs. We're cutting that program. TRIO and GEAR UP, programs that encourage young people to go to college, cutting those programs. Assistance to historically black colleges and universities and Hispanic serving institutions uh, by significant amounts. Those, those uh, deal with a lot of first generation children. Uh, fund for improvement of post secondary education, cut. Our investments in America's future, uh, NASA, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, National Science uh, Foundation, Advanced Research project, all cut. These are investments in our future. National Infrastructure Innovation Fund and in rescinding um, billions in high-speed rail. Other countries are investing in high-speed rail. We're cutting high-speed rail. Now, we, can, we should be more responsible when it comes to balancing the budget. We can do it, but you can't do it by beginning the discussion with an $800 billion tax cut without telling people how are you going to pay for it cutting critical safety net and uh, programs, uh, initiation uh, initiatives to give opportunity for our youth and initiatives that will invest in our future. These are the things that are being cut to fund that tax cut bill from last year. You cannot disassociate ourselves from the connection cuts that we're making today from the tax cut bill that we passed before. People are saying, well, they don't, they don't know, we, we can't afford. Well, we could have afforded had we not passed that tax cut. We need to rescind what we did last year so we do not have to make these draconian cuts this year. We should have been honest with the people last year, and I don't think the people want cuts in Social Security, the safety net, and investments in our future. We can do better, and that's why we're going to be fighting against these draconian cuts that are so important to so many people and make sure that we go off and continue on the right track as we did in 1993 where we could pass a responsible budget address the needs of the people, create jobs, economic activity, and we were on course to paying off the entire national debt. I yield back to the gentlelady from Virgin Islands. Thank you, Mr. Scott, and I remember when uh, the, tax cut was, the tax cuts were being debated and you led us because we knew that um, those tax cuts would be coming, would be paid for by cuts to the programs that our communities need most and that the American people want. The Pew um, Foundation did a poll that showed that people don't want cuts in those programs. And um, it was interesting, Paul Krugman, Paul Krugman in the New York Times today uh, made a good point when he suggested we call the bill, because the bill doesn't have one of those nice names that are usually attached to 
Republican bills when they're doing something that would hurt the public. He suggested we call it the Eat the Future Bill because that's what we're doing. We're taking away now, things now that we need to invest in to build our future. So thank you, uh, Mr. Scott, and thank you for your leadership on the budget. At this time, Mr. Speaker, I would like to yield um, five minutes to our leader, the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, Emmanuel Cleaver from Missouri. Thank you, uh, Congresswoman. I think that uh, what uh, Congressman Bobby Scott just said uh, has to uh, be echoed. And I, as is often said on the floor uh, of this uh, august uh, uh, chamber, is that I would like to associate myself with the comments of the previous speaker. Uh, Congresswoman Donna Christensen uh, has uh, led the, the discussion uh, on this vital issue that uh, we will not uh, be silent about. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in my real life uh, as an ordained United Methodist pastor, uh, I say uh, to uh, our congregation and congregations where I speak that if you want to know what a person is really like, if you want to know who a person really is, look through the checkbook. The checkbook will reveal quite clearly what a person believes in. The same thing is true of a corporation uh, and a nation. And the budget of the United States is a bold statement about who we are as a nation. Uh, it says clearly what we believe in and the things we don't believe in. It is a statement that paints a picture of the United States of America. Mr. Speaker, the picture that is being painted now uh, is a picture that could be used uh, on uh, the Chiller Channel. Uh, it is a picture of a, uh, of a nation uh, that uh, would prefer to move toward deficit and debt reduction uh, by unduly placing pain uh, on the uh, poor uh, or most uh, uh, appropriately and significantly uh, on the men and women of this country uh, who are now uh, pushed aside. Normally when we talk about the, the poor in people's minds they see minorities and people who are lazy and shiftless and who don't want to work. We are experiencing the greatest economic crisis uh, since uh, October 29, uh, October 1929. And the people who we are uh, looking at as being uh, uh, available to be discarded are police officers and teachers and state employees and municipal workers who've been laid off. Every state in the union is having financial problems. Every state in the union is laying off employees. In my hometown, uh, Kansas City, Missouri, uh, we have a 60 a million dollar shortfall. Uh, the state government has a 200 uh, million dollar uh, shortfall. And so state workers are being laid off. Uh, what we are saying now is that the people who are already experiencing pain should get ready to experience some additional pain. And I have heard over and over and over again, well, we, everybody must share in the pain. And the question that I have asked that nobody has answered. I asked this in our committee last week. Why? Why should everybody end up uh, suffering? Uh, because everybody didn't contribute to this problem, number one. And on, on top of that, the individuals who were uh, hurt as a result of the, the recession, we're asking to, to, to receive some additional uh, pain. And that is simply uh, not the way I think we want to project ourselves to ourselves and certainly to the international uh, community. Uh, here's, as, as, Congressman, as Congressman Scott mentioned, we had a tax uh, cut uh, and, and 
uh, made some major decisions before we went home for Christmas. And nobody uh, stood on the floor and repeatedly asked the question, how we're going to pay for it? Well, now uh, we're going to pay for it by equally, as we like to say, uh, trying to place the pain on everyone. We're not talking about getting rid of Freddie Mac and, and Fannie Mae. And the, the amazing thing is that the people, Wall Street, who caused much of the problems are now being rewarded for, calling, for causing the problem. We're going to say, okay, we're going to privatize Fannie, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Uh, we're going to do all kinds of things that would accommodate uh, the, the Wall Street barons who helped cause the, the crises. And the poorest uh, people in this country are going to end up suffering even more so. Uh, we even had to fight to continue unemployment benefits. We had a battle on this floor to continue the unemployment benefits for people uh, who, no fault of their own, lost their jobs, police officers, firefighters. And then we come out with this budget. This budget uh, that we are about to uh, debate is a nervous breakdown on paper. It is not something that we can be proud of as people of the United States uh, because it shows that uh, we don't uh, think in terms of trying to minimize the pain on the least of these. Now, to be sure, the United States faces uh, a painful and profound problem uh, with our deficit and our debt. It has to be dealt with. I asked this in committee last week. I'm on the Financial Services Committee. I asked this question last week. Are we serious about cutting the debt when we say that we're not going to talk about the entitlements? We're not going to talk about Social Security. We're not going to talk about Medicare or Medicaid. Uh, and uh, we, we certainly can't do anything with the, uh, the annual uh, debt service, which is a part of the budget uh, that we uh, can't uh, make decisions on. We have to pay it. Uh, and so if we are not seriously trying to reduce the deficit by dealing with the entitlements, uh, then what we're saying is we're going to play with the, the American public, uh, tell them that we're trying to be serious about the debt, when we know we're not. This is not going to do any kind of substantial uh, uh, reduction in our, in our deficit over the long term. We've got to seriously deal with this problem, and we're not doing it. We Nobody wants to talk about uh, the, the, the Social Security issue because they're thinking about re-election. Not because it shouldn't be dealt with, but they're thinking re-election. And there's criticism. Well, the president should have led the discussion on, on reducing or changing the, the uh, uh, retirement age uh, on Social Security to a higher uh, number or uh, somehow uh, creating a, a, a new system whereby uh, we have a means test where uh, individuals who are making $500,000 a year simply can't also draw their Social Security. We're not even talking about that. And there is nobody on this hill who can stand up and say that we can address this problem very seriously without dealing with uh, the entitlements. And so I am uh, sorry that we're going to hurt uh, so many people uh, in the process of just kind of tinkering around the edges uh, of what is a very serious problem. My final comment, uh, uh, Congresswoman uh, Christensen, is that there were a lot of people who ran for office and said, you know, we're going to deal with this debt deficit. But even they are not talking about the, the only way in which we can change uh, this, this, this problem that we're having. Every economist will tell you that uh, that that's the only way we're going to deal with the, the deficit. There's not a single economist uh, who is uh, credible who will say that we can deal with this in any other way. And yet, we're not dealing with it. And, and, it's, and it's really a, a great, a great uh, tragedy. Uh, I, I do think, as I conclude my uh, comments, uh, Ms. Christensen, uh, that the, the, the whole issue of, uh, of what we're doing uh, it is so painful that even Ben Bernanke is saying, yes, we have to make cuts. But he's also saying you've got to be careful. Look, uh, 
the United States is the only entity putting money into the economy in any serious way right now. And if we withdraw it, there could be economic consequences of, of withdrawing the kind of money that uh, we're talking about uh, withdrawing. Some of us are going to, are going to challenge it at every uh, opportunity because it is the wrong thing to do. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Cleaver. And we're certainly fortunate to have you leading the Congressional Black Caucus at this time. And uh, I think uh, we need a pastor to lead us. My, I, at church yesterday, my minister spoke about our need as Christians, but this would apply to any faith, that we must be on the side of the dispossessed, the helpless, the hopeless, and the marginalized. And the cuts that the Republican majority plans would clearly hurt the least of these and um, are definitely not on their side. I want to yield at this time three minutes to the gentlewoman from Texas, uh, Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson. Thank you very much, uh, Congresswoman Christensen. The National Science Foundation was created in 1950. The Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, and NASA were created in 1958, and the Department of Energy was established in 1977. Some of the technologies which originated from these federal investments include the laser, internet, fiber optics, and nuclear power. Companies which sprang forth from these efforts include companies like Google, SAS, Cisco Systems, Arbiter to Sciences, and Sun Microsystems. These five companies alone employ 130,000 people. 130,000 jobs which were created from relatively modest federal investment. And there are hundreds of companies which had their beginning in federal research grants. The equation is clear. Federal investments in research and development lead to new technologies and products which create jobs. And on the other side of the equation, focused investment in STEM education produces a highly skilled workforce which ensures these high-tech jobs stay in America. At a Science and Technology Committee last session, Tom Donahue of the United States Chamber of Commerce had this to say. Research and development is the very lifeblood of our knowledge economy. That just about sums it up. And in addition to investments in R&D that also help to increase the participation of minorities uh, in the R&D enterprises, through the efforts of many in Congress, including those speaking tonight, we've made great progress in expanding the pool of talent that this country can draw on to address the competitiveness challenge that we are facing. However, the CR before us this week would take us back and undo much of the good work that has been done to date. Let me just quote a few negative impacts of this proposed CR. The CR would severely reduce by 78 percent funding for Hispanic service, servicing colleges and completely eliminate federal support for several other programs for minority serving colleges, including tribal colleges and institutions. And that serve significant numbers of black and Asian students. The key education department program for historically black colleges and universities would lose $85 million of the $266 million it received in 2010, or about a third of it. The CR eliminates $103 million for the tech prep program for vocational education, which heavily benefits community colleges and would also get funding for the creation and support of statewide education data systems and eliminate all congressional earmarks for inst individual institutions, which in 2010 totaled almost $2 billion for colleges and universities. Under this proposal, Title I would be cut by $693.5 million. The cut to Title I of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act would mean 2000 400 schools that serve nearly 1 million disadvantaged students and would lose funding for teachers, tutors, and after-school programs. Nearly 10,000 teacher aides could lose their jobs. Head Start was targeted for the, one of the biggest deductions, a $1 billion cut below fiscal 2010. The massive cut to the Head Start program would remove 
218,000 low-income children and families and closed more than 16,000 Head Start and early Head Start classrooms across the country. It would leave 55,000 teacher and teacher assistants and related staff without jobs. The Pell Grant Scholarship maximum award would be reduced by $845 from $5,550 to $4,750. Many of the 9.4 million students who are projected to receive a Pell Grant in 2011 and 12 school year would see a lower grant award requiring them to take on more loans for their college tuition. In addition, it makes cuts to the programs of the National Science Foundation that would lead to elimination of huge research grants affecting thousands of researchers which can only have a negative impact on opportunities for, for minorities and all to make contributions in science and technology. And I could fill up an hour debate if I were to list Department of Energy, NIST, NASA, NOAA, and EPA. Each of these agencies is critical to our future competitiveness, and each of these agencies is slated for ill-founded cuts. Unfortunately, our children, our grandchildren, will be the ones ultimately to pay this price by this misguided decision. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Johnson, a former chair of the CBC and a leader in science for ma uh, many years. I'd now like to yield uh, three minutes to the other general lady from Texas, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. Let me thank the general lady um, for, for yielding and thank her for leading. And as I see my colleagues on the floor, uh, let me um, just uh, try to focus on one or two points. Uh, and, and maybe on this uh, Valentine uh, evening, I think a lot of our colleagues who are fortunate enough to have their spouses here have rushed off uh, and we're delighted. Let me wish everyone a happy Valentine's Day. And, uh, let me wish my husband in Texas, far away, uh, a happy Valentine's Day. But he might not be having such a good Valentine's Day because he is in higher education. Uh, and frankly, uh, this CR is going to put uh, more than a dent. Uh, it is going to put a real bite. Uh, this is an um, effort to show you what progress we've made. Private sector employment has increased for 12 straight months. Private employers added more than 1.3 million jobs in 2010. But they have to have an educated workforce. And as you can see, we're going up. The cup is half full and not half empty. But when you have the numbers that I'm about to relate to you, where you're seeing Pell Grants cut 15 percent. Mr. Speaker, I met with my university, the University of Houston, Houston Community College, Lone Star, Texas Southern University. And if there was one thing that they emphasized is the equal opportunity that is provided to all students through a Pell Grant. And if we are to go with the CR as it is, we're talking about a reduction in the middle of a school year of $5,550 to 4705 Do you know what that does to a student? It doesn't tell them, let me try to ramp up my extra job. It says I am dropping out. You know what happens to the workforce? It disappears. And so I am concerned that we are in this predicament. So let me tell you something else. I have been a strong champion of the Cops on the Beat program, and we have seen evidence of the fact that we have gained in the downsizing or the decreasing of crime. The proposed CR will cut $600 million in funding to community-oriented policing, and of course what will happen is 3,000 fewer officers. You can be assured Houston, Texas, who got their first COPS grant just a few months ago that I worked very hard on, will be one of the victims of that. And let me just uh, conclude by suggesting that one of the points my good friend, the assistant leader, made, community health clinics is not a partisan issue. It is to give access to all communities, and particularly rural communities. I'm from Texas. One of the reasons I fought so hard for community uh, health clinics, particularly under the Bush administration, when I actually talked to former President Bush and uh, one of our uh, encounters to, to challenge uh, and to encourage uh, how we could, in fact, uh, secure, if you will, more funding for Texas for community health centers in the rural areas. I'm glad we work together. And actually, we've seen a ramp up. And we have seen a ramp up with the Affordable Care Act, which helps to provide uh, the kind of, um, uh, the kind of uh, if you will, health care for those in faraway uh, communities where there are not enough doctors. Finally, 
uh, may I say to you that to cut the National Science Foundation is terrible. It doesn't make any sense. And I would offer to say that this is about work. Health care, cops to make it safe, Pell Grants to train, train the 21st century workforce. I know there are colleagues on the other side of the aisle that will work with us to get this CR where it needs to be. I, too, am for a reasoned budget cutting that we need to do. I did it in years past. We balanced the budget in 1997. We can do it again. And I frankly believe we should not cut into the very quality of life that is so needed. Let me thank uh, my good friend and the Congressional Black Caucus, working with my other colleagues to ensure that we stand for job creation, investing in job creation. Unfortunately, the CR as it stands today, continuing resolution for those who are not assured of what that is, is not going to work. Let's invest in America. I yield back. Thank you, Congresswoman Jackson Lee, and uh, thank you for your leadership on so many issues. And I'm not sure if you mentioned, but there's also some job training uh, programs that would be cut under the CR at a time when jobs are so badly needed across this country. At this time, I'd like to yield uh, three minutes to the gentleman from Georgia, Hank Johnson, who joined me the last time we had a uh, special order. Thanks for joining us again this evening. I thank the gentlewoman from the Virgin Islands and uh, I appreciate how much you care about people and indeed uh, Mr. Speaker the federal government uh, touches all of us every single person who lives in America the federal budget touches each one of us in some way or another whether or not it would be when we call 911 for police help or whether or not we call 911 for um, the fire department uh, or even when we are sending our children to school the teachers, they are touched by the federal budget. What we now have, which has been introduced uh, on Friday uh, by the uh, folks on the other side of the aisle, my Republican brothers and sisters, uh, is an assault on each one of us. It's an extremist position that they have taken to cut things that are so important to Americans' quality of life. And I just simply don't believe that the majority of the American people are in favor of eliminating the positions of thousands of police officers across this land of leaving fire departments high and dry with not enough personnel and we certainly don't want our schools to have hundreds of kids in one classroom because we don't pay for teachers those positions are going to be hurt and severely impacted with these extremist budget cuts that are being recommended by the Republicans. Now, certainly they want to break the backs of the unions that represent these employees because they know that the federal government um, they know that the, the that these workers are protected by monies that the federal government transfers to the states and local governments. In fact, with the recovery bill that was passed out of this very body back in uh, 2009, 800 and some odd billion dollars, it was the greatest transfer of federal dollars to the states in the history of this nation. 
And what it did, Mr. Speaker, was to save the jobs of police officers, firefighters, municipal workers, uh, teachers uh, across this land. But we are now at the point where there is no understanding, no admission that that recovery package actually helped when in fact it did. Lots of people would not be working right now if it had not been for that recovery package. What we want to do now is exactly the opposite. We want to cut the budget. We want to cut aid and assistance to states and local governments to such a degree that it will force those governments to start laying off uh, workers in mass. And it's not good for America. It's not good for Americans. And uh, certainly there's a better way, especially when you think about we could pay for it if we eliminate some of these tax breaks for the, the wealthy and people who don't need them. Take the oil companies, for example. Take the oil companies. Can they afford to lose some of their multi-billion dollar tax breaks in that great big unwieldy tax code? Sure they can. That's going to help us. But in, there's nothing like that coming from my friends in, in, uh, on the other side of the aisle. They just simply want to balance this budget on the backs of the working people of this country. They want to turn this country into a pink slip nation. And they want to balance the budget on the backs of working people. And, and uh, I'm going to do everything I can to, uh, to speak uh, on behalf of the shrinking middle class. And uh, those are the people that I serve. And with that, I'll yield back uh, to, uh, to my good friend from the Virgin Islands. Thank you, Congresswoman. Thank you, Congressman Johnson. And thank you for your passion and on behalf of uh, the middle class and the poor. And as Congressman Scott said, uh, throughout this recession, it's been the working people and the poor who have borne the brunt of the recession and now they're being asked to give more while those who are, were wealthier in the corporations did very well and they're being asked nothing so we do need to you know make sure that our voices are heard and that we do everything we can to make sure that the programs that are so important to this country and to the future of this country if we're going to win the future are not lost in the uh, beginning with the CR. And now I'd like to yield uh, three minutes to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Donald Payne, also a former chair of the Congressional Black Caucus who um, has been a leader on education as well as in international affairs, but education, a senior member of the Education and Labor Committee. Is it Education and Labor? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Let me begin by thanking the gentle lady from the Virgin Islands, Congresswoman Donna Christensen, <clears throat> our distinguished chair of the CBC Health Brain Trust, for anchoring this evening's special in order on the budget. Her leadership and continued diligence in addressing the issues that confront our nation in general, but African Americans in particular, is imperative to our progress as a nation. Recently, Republican House leadership introduced a continuing resolution containing the largest spending cuts in history. Subsequently, President Obama unveiled his FY 2012 budget to support the nation's competitive growth while making difficult decisions to address our economic deficit. I rise today to urge my colleagues to remember as we consider these spending proposals that in addition to our economic deficit, we have a job deficit which continues to worsen in part by an ever-growing educational deficit. They work together. While we must work to rein in on spending, we must not cut funding to extend the development and growth in areas of education and employment will be hampered if we do that. Uh, one of the challenges in addressing unemployment has been the rapid decline 
in certain occupations and industries that are labor markets inability to meet the demand of new occupations and industries. More than two-thirds of workers in occupations and industries that are growing have at least some post-secondary education compared to one-third of workers in occupations and industries that are declining. The demand for post-secondary education as well as rapid increase in baby boom recruitment is predicted to result in a shortage of more than 14 million college graduates by the year 2020 in this country. In addition, military recruiters are likely to experience a shortage in traditional high school recruiting due to high school dropout crisis and low student proficiency levels. Among high school graduates, about one in five do not meet minimum standards necessary to enlist in the U.S. Army today. These facts highlight the reality that our growing educational deficit is a greater long-term threat to our nation's well-being than any other challenge we face today. In the 2009 program for international student assessment, which includes South Korea, uh, Finland, Singapore, uh, continue to fuel our dropouts uh, in our high school and college level. Nearly 7,000 student dropout of school in our nation daily. The first year of American colleges, students are required to take at least one remedial course. Unfortunately, a disproportionate amount of these students are underrepresented minorities, further threatening our, uh, our uh, progress. Uh, countries like Singapore, Finland, Hong Kong, Shanghai, and Canada are doing a better job in this. Our domestic assessment results paint a similar picture. The National Center for Educational Statistics report that of 2009, only 33 percent of our nation's fourth graders are proficient readers. These low proficiency levels continue to fuel the dropout crisis on the high school and college level. Nearly 7,000 students drop out of high school daily, as I mentioned before, uh, and so this really presents a real problem. Further threatening our global standing is the higher education deficit in science and technology. In 2000, Asian universities produced 1.2 million science and education graduates. European universities produced 850. The United States produced 500,000. In an economy dependent upon innovative workforce, in addition to addressing our nation's high school and college graduation rates, we must increase the level of science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM, field graduates. To do so, we must uh, need an innovative agenda to develop the potential of all students, especially underrepresented minorities who have represented the bottom of the academic achievement gap in the country for too long. As I conclude, for this reason, I commend the President for his proposed investments in education to support early learning, improve school, school teachers and leaders, improve science, technology, engineering, and math education, and to promote college ex, uh, access and uh, competition. However, I strongly oppose the nearly $5 billion reduction proposed from the Republican House leadership in areas of education cut to teachers and school leadership programs as well as Head Start, Pell Grants, 21st Century Community Learning Centers are counterproductive in our effort to strengthen our nation's competitive. I am gravely concerned about the proposed cuts to programs that stimulate job growth, assist the working poor, address health disparities, and increase diversity. I strongly oppose cuts to the Women, Infant, and Children's WIC program, training and employment services, community health centers, low-income home energy assistance programs and neighborhood development initiatives. These cuts and other disproportionately impact on our most vulnerable population. While I understand that our economic crisis calls for difficult budgeting constraints, I believe this should be a shared responsibility, not an overhaul of the nation's economic crisis at the expense of the most vulnerable population in our global competition as well as a nation. Thank you very much and I yield back. Thank you, um, Congressman Payne, for